Mm, greetings, mathletes. Look at this. This video is being released a full six days before the next class. This is unprecedented, but you know what? I said to myself, I've let these kids down the last two weeks. I can't possibly do it again. So I'm giving you all ample time to watch this video. 100% watch completion. By next class, I think we can do it. I believe in you. And I don't believe in a lot of people, but I believe in you. That's why I won Teacher of the Year right there. No flex or anything. But who am I kidding? I'm flexing. Anyway, nice to see you, uh, kind of, virtually? I don't know. I'm not really seeing you. You're seeing my voice. You're hearing my voice, but not seeing it. Um, maybe you are seeing it. I don't know. Maybe you have, like, superhuman abilities. Although that would be a really weird superhuman ability. I, like, I'd want to trade it in for something, like, marginally cooler. But anyway, this video got off topic extremely quickly. Uh, back on track. This next video is on evaluating limits algebraically. So last class, the last video you watched was a little bit of an intro into what limits are and figuring out what they look like um, graphically and then also evaluating them and estimating them in the same way. Um, but I promised you in that video that we would get to more concrete ways, more efficient ways, and more commonly used ways to evaluate limits. Um, and we're going to talk about all those different ways in this video. So something that you might have caught on to um, in the last video and in last class is that a lot of the results we got for the limits by investigating the graph um, matched with what you would just get if you plugged the particular x value in for the function you were using to find the limit. And that's actually a fantastic way to evaluate the limit. When we start learning them, we look at it graphically so we know what is actually going on. But for all intents and purposes, if you can plug the number you're trying to approach, A, into your function and you get a real answer, that's your limit. That's your answer. Always try that first. Most times, especially in BC calculus and in AB as well, this will never work. Um, it's just way too easy, right? It's just substitute, plug and chug, simplify, and then you're done, right? There's not really much to it. So you pretty much will never get a question that's this easy, but it does work. So, you know, for example, here, the first one, if I wanted to find the limit as x approaches 3 of x plus 3 quantity squared, instead of graphing that, looking at a table, etc., all you need to do is plug it in. As long as the function is continuous and gives you a real value at that x value you're plugging in, that's your limit. So 3 plus 3 squared, that's 6 squared. So the answer to that limit is 36. Now you could confirm this using a table. You could confirm it using a graph. They're all good ways to check your answer. Here we have an exponential function, no change. 2 to the 6th. Uh, let's see, that comes out to a number. That comes out to 64. Come on, get it together, math teacher. You're supposed to be the professional here. Okay, so limit as x approaches 2, we have a rational function here. Now, oftentimes rational functions cause problems especially in the form of getting a 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form. We briefly touched on those in the last video. Um, so usually these functions will give you trouble, but they still offer you um, an answer if you plug in 2 here, for example, and get a real number. Um, oftentimes they do work out. Sometimes they don't, but here it will. So we're going to get 4 plus 6 plus 1, so that's 11, uh, over 4 plus 1, which is 5. So we get 11 fifths. And there you go. Okay, let's take a look at a log. Um, again, this changes nothing. It's a function, right? So as long as the x value we're plugging, is, plugging in is defined on that function and we get a real answer, um, that's our limit. So log base 3. Let's see. 4 times 2 to the 3rd. Uh, so that's going to be 4 times 8, uh, which is 32 minus 5, and that's 27. So good news for us. We can actually simplify that log. The answer to this is whatever... 3 to the question mark, right? Question mark is our answer. 3 to the what gets us 27. The answer to that is 3. Cool. And then finally here we have a radical function. Again, no change. Um, go ahead and plug in 3. So the cube root of 6 plus 2, which is 8. And luckily that's simplifiable. That comes out to 2. All right. So it's that easy. That's always kind of your first line of defense. Can I just plug in the a value that I'm approaching? Uh, if you get a real answer, that's your answer. Box it, move on. Okay, um, But oftentimes, and I'm just telling you this up front, uh, those, those problems are no fun. 
right? Just plugging it in and getting a number isn't much of a challenge, especially for all you honors kids, right, that are going to be taking some sort of advanced placement calculi next year. Um, so by far the more common result when you try to plug in the A value that you're approaching for your limit, by far the more common result is you get what's called an indeterminate form when you try to just brute force it and plug it in, uh, i.e. one of these two forms here. 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Now, we kind of have this muscle that we want to scratch, right? That we want to stretch that says, oh, anything divided by itself is just 1. Well, that's true for every single real number you can think of except for 0, right? Because when we think about what division is and what's actually happening when we do that, 0 over 0 makes no sense, right? I have nothing divided into no groups. That makes my brain explode. And since it makes my brain explode, that means it's not doable. It's indeterminate. The answer is being masked. We have to do some more algebra. Infinity over infinity also does not equal 1. All right? Everything divided by everything. Well, where do I cut it off? Right? Where do I stop? As soon as I think I've divided everything by everything, there's an infinite number of numbers I haven't included. Right? You can't just truncate it. Um, so indeterminate forms are never an answer. It's code for do more algebra okay now after you do more algebra you might get a limit that exists or you might get one that doesn't exist right but both of those are fine answers an indeterminate form is never an answer it is code for you need to do more work and I'm gonna show you what the different things you could do look like okay so here's something that's called the equal function rule if f of x is equal to g of x when x isn't equal to a, so we have two different x values, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of g of x. What that means is this. If f of x is equal to g of x, their limits will be the same as x approaches a, meaning that I'm allowed to simplify functions down and I can still get the same limit I would have gotten for the original. So here, let's take a look at this first example. I'm trying to take the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 4. If you directly substitute in 2, we end up with 0 over 0. Okay, and that's an indeterminate form. You don't need to write this every time, but I'm going to. So this is code for more algebra. Now, one of the more common things you're going to do for the algebra is you're going to want to factor everything and cancel okay and oftentimes that will remove the problem so the limit as x approaches 2 let's go ahead and factor the top and the bottom the top factors into x minus 2 times x minus 1 all over and then we have a difference of squares there x minus 2 times x plus 2 so the thing that's causing the 0 over 0 the indeterminate form is this x minus 2 divided by x minus 2 now if we cancel those out we can now find our limit. This is the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 1 over x plus 2. And now we can directly substitute because we've eliminated the problem, right? We've eliminated the thing that was giving us the 0 over 0. So we plug this in, we get 2 minus 1 over 2 plus 2, and that gets us 1 fourth for our limit. And we're done, okay? Now, if you actually tried to graph this function, there'd be a hole in it at x equals 2. Uh, the y value of that hole would be one-fourth. But when you're finding a limit, remember the function doesn't have to be defined at the a value we're approaching, right? We just need to be able to say, well, it looks like we're approaching this. It doesn't actually have to be defined there. Okay, taking a look at the next one, this is another example where we get zero over zero. So the limit as x approaches negative one, if we directly substitute, we get an indeterminate form. So let's go ahead and uh, simplify this. So the limit as x approaches negative one, top factors into x plus two, times x plus 1 all over x minus 1 times x plus 1. So those cancel out and we're left with the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x plus 2 over x minus 1. Notice how I'm always rewriting all my notation every single time until I actually take a limit. The moment you need to stop writing the limit is when you actually go ahead and plug in the x value. Right? So here we're getting negative 1 plus 2 over negative 1 minus 1. And notice I didn't write the limit notation anymore. So here we're getting negative 1 half. Okay, there you go. Let's try one more. 
kind of an interesting problem here. We have the limit as x approaches 16 of root x minus 4 over x minus 16. Again, this gives us 0 over 0. There's actually two ways to go about doing this problem. First way is you could multiply by the conjugate. Multiply by the conjugate. Uh, we see that radical there, right? So the conjugate, in case you forget, is if we have x plus c, we multiply it times root x minus c. Okay. So we see that radical. Immediately, we maybe start thinking conjugate. So let's go ahead and try that out, see what happens. So x approaches 16 here, limit. We have the original root x minus 4 over x minus 16. We're going to multiply the top and bottom by root x plus 4, which is the conjugate. Okay. So let's go ahead and multiply the top out. So we're going to take the limit as x approaches 16. If we multiply that top out, we're going to get x. The middle terms will cancel, and then we have minus 16. And on the bottom, don't foil that out. Keep it the same. It's going to make it harder to see what to cancel. And here it should be pretty obvious what to cancel. We're going to want to get rid of the x minus 16s. And so now we have the limit as x approaches 16 of 1 over root x plus 4. So that's going to be 1 eighth. Cool. That's one way to do it. You might have been thinking another way, though. So here's another way to do it. You actually could factor this, right? You actually do have a difference of squares here, but it's not what you're used to seeing. You guys are used to seeing difference of squares when the power of x is squared, right? So if we had x squared minus 16 in the denominator, you would probably immediately think, oh, that's x minus 4x plus 4. We actually can still do it here, but instead of doing the x squared, right? We just have x to the first. That x minus 16 factors into root x minus 4, root x plus 4. Which is kind of an uncommon way to do that problem, but it still works. So we have root x minus 4 on the top. The bottom factors into root x minus 4, root x plus 4. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe that witchery, multiply it back through. I guarantee you'll get what we started with. And if we finish up the problem here, we have 1 over root x plus 4, we get the same thing. We get an eighth, right? So whatever way you want to do the problem is cool. Um, but the algebra here works out quite nicely. Okay, so let's look at limits at infinity of this form here. So here we have a function, x to the n, okay? And this tells us about the n behavior of whatever polynomial we're looking at, right? So this is a monomial. Okay. But we know that when we write out a polynomial, the thing that determines the end behavior is that first term. So for example, if I had 3x squared plus 2x minus 4, right? the thing there that determines the end behavior, like we've talked about so many times before, is the leading term. right? That holds all the sway in terms of what this is going to look like. right? So our mathematical brains hopefully know that when we have a leading term of x squared and a is positive, the end behavior is up, up, right? So when we're taking limits as x approaches infinity, in order to figure out the value of that limit very quickly, all we need to look at is the leading term to see what's going on, okay? So here's an example. Oh, our home phone is ringing. God dang it, who has home phones anymore? Apparently John and Cindy O'Rourke. So the limit as x approaches infinity of x to the n equals infinity, right? So if I plug in infinity for n, this is just going to blow up, right? In other words, it's going to equal infinity, okay? Uh, for any positive real number n, these next two also hold. So, you know, if n happens to be, I don't know, um, a positive number, positive even number like 2 or 4 or 6 or 8, right? Um, if the leading coefficient is positive, if you plug in negative infinity to this, right, you're still going to get positive infinity. So in other words, negative infinity squared or negative infinity to the fourth, right? Those all still yield positive infinity. Um, but if I'm taking the limit as x approaches negative infinity of x to the n, and n is odd, like to the first or the third or the fifth, I'm going to get negative infinity, right? And that makes sense for how the n behavior looks, right? So if I have x to the third, you know, that looks like this, 
right? So as we go towards negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity, okay? So negative infinity to the third or negative infinity to the fifth, right? Those all yield negative infinity. Cool. So for polynomial functions, all we need to look at is that first term. That's all that matters. So if I'm trying to take the limit as x approaches infinity, instead of graphing this whole thing, the only thing we need to focus on is this first term, 3x to the 12th. Well, that's a positive a value, and it's an even power of x. So that's just going to get us infinity as an answer. Okay. Here I'm taking the limit as x approaches negative infinity of this whole polynomial. But again, the only term that really matters is that first one, 3x to the 11th. If I'm raising negative infinity to an odd power, I'm still going to get negative infinity. Times 3 is still going to be negative infinity. Both of these don't exist, right? But we're being as specific as we can, okay? Both don't exist. But be specific, okay? So those are all well and good, but really the more interesting problems are when we take limits involving infinity, limits at infinity, for this function right here. 1 over x to the n. Okay, the 1 in the numerator is fixed, right? So for any positive real number n, if I take the limit as x approaches infinity or the limit as x approaches negative infinity for something of the form 1 over x to the n where n is a positive real number, both of those limits are equal to 0. And if we think about why, it's pretty obvious. The numerator remains stationary at 1. But if I plug in infinity for x to the n, I get infinity to the n, which is infinity. So a fixed number 1 over infinity, you should think of this as, oh, a number divided by something massive. This is so small, 0 0.0000, who knows, right? It's so massively small that we just call this 0. Ooh, an email that we just call it zero, okay? Um, so keep that in mind, both of these, super important, as we get into these types of problems. Uh, let's go ahead and find the limit here. So the function is 2x squared plus 5x plus 6 over x squared minus 3x minus 4. Let's say I wanted to take the limit as x approaches infinity. Okay, this is a rational function. We've also already talked about in the previous section, how limits as x approaches plus or minus infinity are really just asking you what's the horizontal asymptote, right? But I want to show you a more algebraically rigorous way to do this, um, where you're not just saying, oh, the horizontal asymptote is this, let me just go ahead and write it, okay? So we're trying to take the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x squared plus 5x plus 6 all over x squared minus 3x minus 4. Okay, so let me browse some directions here. To proceed, we're going to take advantage of this little tiny note I wrote up here, right? These two guys. To proceed, we're going to divide every term by the highest power of x in the denominator. And this will guarantee that you can use that little property from above. It's some dirty underhanded algebra, but it works and it allows us to get an answer quite rigorously. So let's go ahead and try it out. The limit as x approaches infinity. Now this is only for limits at infinity what we're doing here, okay? So the highest power of x in the denominator is x squared. So we're gonna divide every single term by x squared, okay? So we're going to get 2x squared over x squared plus 5x over x squared plus 6 over x squared all over x squared over x squared and then minus 3x over x squared minus 4 over x squared. And then we simplify this out. So the limit as x approaches infinity, we're going to get 2 plus 5 over x plus 6 over x squared, all over 1 minus 3 over x 
minus 4 over x squared. So maybe you're asking yourself, why are we even doing this? We're doing this so that we can now take the limit as x approaches infinity and use the above properties. If you have a constant divided by a function of the form x to the n, we know that when we take the limit as x approaches infinity, that just comes out to 0. So the limit as x approaches infinity of 5 over x, that goes to 0. 6 over x squared, that goes to 0. 3 over x goes to 0, and 4 over x squared goes to 0. And so this just comes out to 2 plus 0 plus 0 over 1 minus 0 minus 0. So we get 2 as our answer. Really simple. Okay. Now, something else you could do. Since we know only the leading terms really matter in terms of limits at infinity, you could truncate everything else off and take the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x squared over x squared. And you get the same result. The x squareds cancel, and you're taking the limit as x approaches infinity of 2, which just equals 2. Right? There's no variable there. Both are fine ways, and you should be aware of both of them. All right, let's try some more with this. Okay, This one I already did the work out for us. Uh, the function here is x squared plus x plus 2 over 3x cubed plus 4. So again, we're going to divide through by the highest power of x in the denominator, which is x cubed. Okay, If we do that and simplify, we come to this function right here. And now we're going to take the limit as x approaches infinity. So we take the limit of each piece. Everything in the numerator, all of these... These all go to 0, right? They all match that definition from the previous page. This is going to stay as 3, and that's also going to go to 0. So we end up with 0 over 3, so the answer to that limit is 0. Okay. Let's try another one. That was an example of the denominator having a larger power than the numerator, which we know has a horizontal asymptote at 0, so it's no surprise that the answer came out to 0. On the previous example, here the degree the top and bottom were the same. So the horizontal asymptote was at y equals 2, and our answer matched that. Okay. Here, the numerator degree is bigger than the denominator. So this one, there's no horizontal asymptote. And so let's see what we get for our answer. Perhaps you're already thinking about what it's going to be. Okay, so first things first. Let's go ahead and simplify this function down. Divide everything by x squared, and we end up with 2x plus 4 plus 5 over x minus 6 over x squared all over 4 minus 6 over x plus 1 over x squared. So now we're going to take the limit as x approaches negative infinity of that function. So let's go ahead and plug in infinity. We have 2 times negative infinity plus 4 plus 0 minus 0 over 4 minus 0 plus 0. So this comes out to negative infinity plus 4 over 4. Okay, negative infinity plus 4 is still negative infinity divided by 4, still negative infinity. And that's our answer. Okay. So, think about if this matches up with the idea of there not being a horizontal asymptote, right? If there's no horizontal asymptote, then the function isn't tending towards anything as it goes really far out to the left and to the right. So here, we're just looking at the end behavior, right? The top is x cubed, and so as we go out to the left, we're going to go to negative infinity. Okay, and that's exactly the result we got here. Okay, uh, one more here. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take the limit as x approaches infinity for this one, and let's see what we get. So again, the degree of the numerator is bigger than the bottom, so we expect to get infinity or negative infinity for this answer. If we simplify this out first, dividing everything by x squared, we have 6x minus 5 plus 9 over x minus 2 over x squared. And then in the denom, we get 5 minus 7 over x plus 9 over x squared. So now we'll take the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. And if we do that, we get 6 times infinity minus 5, and uh, the next two terms are going to go to 0, over 5 minus 0 plus 0. So infinity minus 5 over 5, that's just going to be infinity. Okay. So again, no horizontal asymptote. Our answer goes off to infinity. 
Okay, so that's it for rational functions. Let's take a look at some interesting trig limits, okay? So the limit as x approaches zero. If you take the sine of zero, you unsurprisingly get zero, okay? So the limit as x approaches zero for sine of x is equal to zero, and that makes sense, right? We can see it right on this graph. This is a graph of sine, and on from both sides it's approaching zero. We could also see it in the table, okay? So the limit as x approaches zero of sine x is equal to zero. Same for the cosine curve, right? If we can plug it in and get an answer, just go ahead and do that. Cosine of zero is one, right? Comes out to one, we can see it graphically, and we can see it on a table, okay? So the lesson learned here, trig functions work the same way. If you can plug it in, great. If not, we have to do something else, like this special trig limit here. This is an incredibly important trig limit that you need to memorize for the rest of forever. We use it in calculus all the time. You'll use it in multivar beyond that. And the reason it's worth memorizing is because it's not immediately obvious how to get this answer. The limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. If we go ahead and substitute this directly, you end up with zero over zero, which is indeterminate, okay? Meaning we have to get the answers by some other means. The, the way to do this algebraically is not something we're going to learn this year. You're going to have to wait till you learn what's called L'Hopital's rule next year. But for right now, we can turn to the old tried and true methods of looking at a graph or looking at a table. If you actually go into your TI-84 and graph sine x over x in radian mode, you get this nice looking graph here. And so actually, when you look at this graphically, it's pretty easy to see that as x approaches 0 from both sides, we're approaching 1. And the table also confirms this. So here it is. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. Memorize this. I know we're distance learning, but even for next year, you have to know that. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. All right. And we can also now use this in other derivations. Let's go ahead and try this out, and we'll wrap this video up. So let's say we wanted to take the limit as x approached 0 of tan x. Well, you could just plug it in and find that the tangent of 0 is 0, which is fine. But let's say we wanted to use some trig identities, and we split tan x into sine x over cosine x. Okay. If we plug in 0 for x, we get 0 over 1, so we get 0. Okay. Both of the same. Okay. So tan kind of works the same way. Here's another really popular identity that we're going to figure out what this is using the sine x over x1 from the previous page. Here, the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine x minus 1 over x. If we directly substitute, we get 0 over 0, which is no good. So what we're going to do here, it's not immediately obvious what to do. Pause the video if you'd like to try on your own. Otherwise, I'm going to continue on. We're actually going to multiply by the conjugate. We're going to multiply by cosine x plus 1 over cosine x plus 1. Trig conjugates are not as obvious, but they're just as useful as radical conjugates. So if we go ahead and do this, limit as x approaches 0, and we multiply out the top, that comes out to cosine squared x minus 1. And the bottom, let's not multiply it out, let's just keep it as x times cosine x plus 1. Okay, so the top, if we take advantage of our golden goose of trig identities, sine squared plus, whoops, sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, right? The golden goose of trig identities. The top is equal to negative sine squared x. So the limit as x approaches 0, place that with negative sine squared x all over x times cosine of x plus 1. Okay. So the idea with pretty much all trig limits is you want to isolate a sine x over x as you're taking the limit as x approaches 0, and then redefine that as 1. And that's going to remove the problem. That's going to remove this 0 over 0. So let's go ahead and do that. So the limit as x approaches 0, we can take a sine out of the numerator and an x out of the denominator. And we just have this. That's equal to 1. So then we can just take the limit as x approaches 0 of the remaining stuff, which is negative sine x over cosine x plus 1. Okay. So that's equal to 1. So we get 
1 times, and if we plug in 0, we get 0 over 2, which is 0. So this whole thing comes out to 0. So now, here is another identity that is considered common knowledge by most mathematicians. Now that we've proven this, you can use this all the time. The limit as x approaches 0 of cosine x minus 1 over x, that's equal to 0. Okay. Sometimes it's just as useful as the sine x over x equal to 1. Okay. And uh, there you go. There's the end of our video. Okay. So, uh, hopefully you enjoyed that one. Um, we're starting to get into the good stuff here. Uh, we have to walk before we can run, though. And unfortunately, we won't get to the very best stuff like we normally do this year, but it's all good. Um, it'll just make next year all the more sweeter. There's the signature, so you know it's an original, not a counterfeit notes thing. Um, yeah. Uh, next video, we're going to talk about the limit definition of continuity, the three-step test. It's going to be good times. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Feel free to open the textbook and try out some problems if you want to. Uh, otherwise, looking forward to discussing limits with you peeps next week on Thursday. Uh, more about limits. We're almost done with distance learning. So sad. Um, yeah, hopefully I have a good uh, corny math joke to share with you as well. Comment below in the comments if you have a joke you'd like to share. Oh, and uh, shout out to Evan, who on the last video commented that Tiger King is overrated, TBH. Well, Evan, you're overrated. Ooh, burn. Okay, peace out, Cub Scout. Get some ice for that burn. Whoa. Okay, bye.